Good afternoon. Uh, our Secretary General uh, arrived in Vietnam a little earlier today, where he, um, upon arrival, met with the state uh, president and then later with the General Secretary of the Communist uh, Party. He also took part in a ceremony to commemorate uh, the 45th anniversary of Vietnam's membership in the United Nations. In his remarks, the Secretary General said, we need justice, greater solidarity, and greater cooperation, and nowhere do we need it more and more urgently than in our fight against the climate crisis. He emphasized that action on loss and damage is a moral imperative that must be front and center in the forthcoming COP climate conference in Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, the Secretary General also stressed the need to ensure respect for fundamental freedoms, including the express freedom of expression and association, to protect civil society working to bring these rights to life, and to ensure the full engagement from journalists to human rights defenders to environmental advocates. The Secretary General said that the UN looks forward to deepening its work with Vietnam for peace and sustainable development, as well as human rights for all. His full remarks were shared with you, and tomorrow he will meet with the Prime Minister of Vietnam and will participate in a dialogue with Vietnamese youth and student representatives, and will also visit the Vietnam Meteorological and Hydrological Administration uh, to talk about climate uh, adaptation and climate change. And uh, we will have him back here in New York on Monday. Uh, moving to uh, Ukraine, uh, excuse me, up, 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 up. moving to Ukraine, where our humanitarian colleagues are telling us that yesterday and today, missile attacks in the cities of Kharkiv and Zaporizhia caused civilian casualties and damaged civilian infrastructure, including a school in Zaporizhia. Power outages continue across four northern and central oblasts of Ukraine, um, as well as in the capital, Kyiv. On the 20th of October, that would have been yesterday, an interagency convoy delivered eight trucks uh, worth of shelter, water, sanitation, hygiene materials uh, to Vilitska Oleksandrivka. Okay, thank you. <laughs> a uh, newly retaken area in the southern uh, uh, Kersonska Oblast. Supplies were provided by the International Organization for Migration, the UN Refugee Agency, the World Health Organization. Also on October 20th, uh, working with a local NGO, uh, UNHCR delivered uh, emergency shelter materials to a settlement in Zaporizhka. In Zaporizhka. So uh, the delivery followed a missile attack which had damaged and destroyed about 200 homes, according to our local partners. UNHCR also provided generators and fan heaters to local authorities in the northern Sumska Oblast to enable hospitals and other civilian infrastructure to keep running uh, to keep running following missile attacks. As a reminder, this afternoon there will be an open meeting in the Security Council uh, on Ukraine. The briefers from our side will include Denise Brown, the humanitarian coordinator who you heard from here yesterday, and she will be joined by Rosemary DiCarlo, the head of the political and peacebuilding department. To Haiti, uh, so moving to Haiti, um, our UN colleagues and local partners are working alongside the government despite the many operational challenges to respond to the needs of people impacted by cholera. Under the lead of the Haitian Ministry of Health, the Pan American Health Organization has supported partners for the opening of 13 cholera treatment centers with a maximum capacity of 585 beds. As of today, uh, we are told that more than 100 of those beds are still available to treat patients. Oral rehydration points are also being established in impacted communities to treat milder cases and refer others to inpatient facilities. PAHO, in cooperation with, the, with uh, the UN system and local NGO partners, are assisting health authorities to train about 150 of its community health workers and is due to train 150 more. They will also conduct risk communications and community engagement activities as well as the surveillance of reporting cases, notably in Cité Soleil, one of the most vulnerable and impacted neighborhoods in the capital, Port-au-Prince. For its part, our friends at the UN Children's Agency, UNICEF, are supporting the Haitian authorities and partners with chlorine, water purification tablets, hygiene kits, medical supplies, such as oral rehydration salts. 
The agency is also deploying mobile health clinics in Cité uh, Soleil. Our humanitarian air service, the UN uh, UNHAS, is helping to deliver medical supplies to other parts of the country. Meanwhile, we continue to inform people how to prevent uh, getting cholera. UNICEF has launched a series of radio spots, and PAHO has sent out a million SMS messages and is due to send out more. Moving to West Africa, yesterday the, um, in Burkina Faso, Martin Griffiths wrapped up his one-day visit. He said that, we, that said what, what he saw and heard left a deep impression on him. He warned that humanitarian needs are rising fast. A quarter of the, uh, a quarter of the population, or some 4.9 million people, need emergency assistance a staggering 40% more people than at the beginning of the year. One in 10 Burkina Bays displaced from their homes by devastating conflict and climate shocks. Meanwhile, he said growing insecurity and blockades in many areas have left communities cut off from the rest of the country and are facing growing hunger. At the same time, he added, the amount of humanitarian assistance available is simply inadequate. Mr. Griffiths said that the new, he met the new transition president, Ibrahim Traore, and has stressed the need for civilians, uh, for the protection of civilians, including for those unable or unwilling to leave the areas of military operations. And he also called for more resources for life-saving relief. $805 million response plan in Burkina Faso is only a third funded, as we told you yesterday. Turning to Sudan, the humanitarian relief coordinator at interim, Eddie Rao, has expressed his deep concern about recent violence in West Kordofan and Blue Nile states. Uh, in Al Lagoa, in West Kordofan, violence escalated following a land ownership dispute, and authorities report at least 19 people have been killed, 34 injured. As violence continues, more than 36,000 people have fled the town. That's according to the International Organization for Migration. In Wad Al Mahi, in Blue Nile State, intercommunal violence has now spread to several localities, and at least 1,200 people have been displaced. As fighting continues, unconfirmed reports refer to many people killed. Two days ago, the governor of Blue Nile State issued a decree prohibiting the movement of civilians using trucks within Wad Al Mahi. This restriction of their freedom of movement prevents people from seeking safety and accessing life-saving services. Um, the humanitarian coordinator reminds all parties to the conflict to comply with their obligations under international humanitarian law and to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure, including health facilities, schools, and water systems. He also urged the parties to allow for the free movement of people looking for safety and assistance. The statement is available online. Uh, from Pakistan, UNICEF is warning today that the flood impacted areas of Sindh and Balochistan. Uh, more than one in nine children under five admitted to health facilities were suffering from severe acute malnutrition. They say the, estimate, uh, the estimates based on pre-existing malnutrition prevalence indicate that close to 1.6 million children could be suffering from malnutrition or in need of urgent treatment in the areas impacted uh, by the floods. UNICEF is responding, uh, including sending ready-to-use therapeutic food together with the government, the World Food Program, and other partners. UNICEF established 271 outpatient um, th therapeutic treatment centers for the prevention, detention, and treatment of cases of secure, severe acute malnutrition and other forms of malnutrition. They're also working to expand nutrition services through 73 mobile health teams in the flood-affected districts. This is in addition to protection, health, water, sanitation, and hygiene services. The agency has revised its appeal to $175.3 million. Um, there will be a press briefing in this room uh, at 1 p.m. by Ian Fry, Special Rapporteur of the Promotion and protection of human rights in the context of climate change. Um, we had hoped to have had uh, David Gressley, but it turns out he can't brief uh, today. We'll have him in the next 10 days or so. He's promised us that. Uh, we hope to have Martin Griffiths here at some point uh, during uh, the week. And hopefully this is something for me to announce. No? No? Uh, bear with me two seconds because people keep calling me as if they don't know what I'm doing at noon. Um, no, the, him, I would stop and I would answer. And you would hear, uh, you would hear that ring. Um, sorry. Uh, James, go, go ahead. Okay, 
Um, first question then on Ukraine. Uh, President Zelensky says he believes there are plans uh, to blow up um, a hydroelectric uh, dam, the Novokavkovskaya uh, Dam. Sorry, I probably said that wrong. Um, in the Kherson, in the Kherson region, that would cause catastrophic damage. Um, is the um, UN reaching out to the Russian Federation about this? Is the UN concerned about this suggestion? Well, I mean, we, we have no, uh, obviously, no insights into what may happen. Uh, what we have seen during this conflict is uh, the destruction of civilian infrastructure, and we would not want to see that increase in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Uh, you're not doing any modeling on what the effect would be, on the, the effect on uh, what would be damaged? I'm not aware of uh, us doing any okay. modeling. Um, in staying with Ukraine, but also bringing in Iran, um, back to the drones again, the UK, France, and Germany have written a letter. Has the Secretary General received that letter? And what is the latest on the Secretary General's deliberations on sending an investigation team to look at the remnants of the drone that have been recovered by Ukraine? We have seen, the, I'm not sure the Secretary General himself has seen the letter given where, where he is, but I've, I'm aware of the letter, uh, we've seen it. Um, I have nothing more to add to you on, on, on the process except to, to reiterate that we will analyze any information brought to our attention by member states. And a last one, which is staying with Iran now, um, Amnesty International has said in the latest protest, 23 children have been killed in the crackdown by yeah, Iranian I mean, authorities. What's the reaction from the Secretary General? I, I mean, we've spoken about this already. Our, our colleague, Catherine Russell, our colleague at UNICEF, has. Uh, we continue, we're continuing to be very concerned about uh, about the ongoing uh, protests. Uh, it is, again, incumbent uh, on authorities to ensure that only proportional force uh, is used and that if there are any deaths, that they be, uh, they be fully investigated and people be held to account. Would you say that if there are 23 children being, who have been killed, then proportionate force has not been used? Well, I, I don't know the exact circumstances of each, but it's, it's clear that uh, people should not be uh, dying while, uh, while peacefully protesting. Mr. Klein. Uh, first, just a follow-up. I think I asked you this two weeks ago and again to Farhan last Friday about the uh, complaint that was filed by UN Watch with the Secretary General. Last Friday, I think Farhan said it's being processed. Yep. Could you tell us what that means? Uh, you know, what, what is the status? So that's that means that it's being processed, that it was received, and it's being processed and will be dealt with as soon as I know uh, what the outcome of that process, uh, I will let you know. You, ca you can't describe for us what that process entails? I, the process in I mean, the process entails somebody looking at the, at the complaint and deciding how it should be handled. Okay. And then um, <clears throat> on Ukraine, um, the Secretary General has, uh, has often said uh, that uh, there's really no, ultimately no military solution in, to uh, the conflict in Ukraine and uh, war needs to end as soon as possible for many reasons. Uh, but I wonder if he would agree with the sentiment of a um, cardinal in the Vatican who's said to be a close ally of Pope Francis who said that it, it's, in his view, it's better to lose a piece of sovereignty and resolve conflicts. Um, so this trade-off between negotiating a, a, a way of a bit of territory, territorial sovereignty on the part of Ukraine, is that a reasonable trade-off to get uh, to the objective of ending this war once and for all? I, I'm not going to start commenting what anonymous cardinals uh, may, may be saying, but what I, I, that being said, I mean, the Secretary General has been very clear that yes, there is no military solution. He's also been very clear in the fact that he doesn't see any immediate prospect uh, for peace, which is uh, not something he is uh, observing uh, with glee. On the, on the contrary, I think this, is, this, this, uh, this continues uh, the tragedy of this, uh, of this conflict. In the end, the parties uh, will have to will have to decide. Veronica, thank you so much, Steph. I want to ask you about um, <clears throat> I want to ask you about uh, the Dmitry Polyansky, who's deputy ambassador um, of Russia. 
uh, said that if UN Commission goes to conduct any illegal investigations uh, about the origin of drones that are currently killing Ukrainians, Russia is going to reassess its relations with the Secretary General. I want to ask you uh, whether this argument uh, can somehow uh, spoil the future of the Black Sea Grain Initiative that uh, is supposed to end um, on November, in November. Uh, and uh, what was the reaction of Secretary General I, on that claim? With, with great respect, Veronica, I think I, I, I went into this uh, yesterday, and I, I don't I, you could look at the transcript because my, our position hasn't um, hasn't changed, uh, or so I I don't want to reopen. Oh, re that's okay. No, I'm just uh, yeah. Uh, Doug Hammerschultz, fellow, and uh, Charles Ossat newspaper. Uh, are you monitoring the cholera outbreak in Lebanon and Syria, and what are the measures that the UN uh, could take to to help the Lebanese and Syrian government? To, to contain uh, the spread of the disease. Yes, I know in in Syria we've had uh, uh, we've had updates uh, and we are doing what we can. I have to and and supporting uh, government supporting local communities. Uh, let me get an update uh, from uh, from Lebanon. But obviously, uh, cholera is a um, uh, is an extremely dangerous and fast uh, spreading uh, condition, uh, and we have we have the know-how. We will work with with those governments. If to some. Um, <clears throat> Seth, my question is also about uh, Ukraine and the uh, drones. So w whether uh, the Russians used uh, Iranian drones or not, that will be decided. But my question is, um, in the future, whether you have an investigation or not, but my question is, from your um, perspective uh, and to uh, what, uh, and from your legal uh, opinion, um, does the Iranians uh, last week, were t this week, we were talking about the fact that, um, okay, they said they didn't provide Russia with drones, but even if it does not go against um, uh, paragraph 4, Annex um, B, uh, from 2231 resolution, uh, do you agree with that? Is, um, or do you do see... Do I agree with... If, if the Iranians um, provided the Russians with drones, does this go against um, re uh, paragraph 4, <coughs> Annex B, in two, two, three, one. Uh, I'm not going to expand on that. I think I, I think that you know we're, first of all, it's up to the Security Council in many cases to ultimately mm -hmm. really to interpret uh, the Council resolutions. You know, you've you've all valiantly tried to to get me uh, to move forward on this uh, on this point. I just I, I just won't at this time. I mean, I and I, I understand the uh, I understand the importance of the issue. I understand your needs. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I mean, I think, you know, Denise Brown, who was here yesterday, said she didn't know where these drones came from, but what she did see is the damage these these drones and the, these attacks have, have caused uh, quite a lot of damage. Um, so I have nothing else to say besides what I just said to, to James on anything related to, um, to 2231 and, and, and possible violations or non-violations. Yep. But your legal team and what Di Carlo said last week in the closed meeting in the Security Council uh, was supposed to go also in that uh, whether uh, such um, providing such drones would be in breach of uh, Resolution Two Two Three One, and you have you must have a legal I mean, opinion. You, you, uh, the fact we have a lot of opinions which we may not want to share with you. That's not we we may have opinions uh, on all sorts of uh, of all sorts of things. Um, the the resolution. I mean, the resolution is a public document. You may also want to read read the resolution, and you can do your own uh, analysis. Okay, uh, Mr. Brucati, and then I have a statement to read. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I have a question regarding Ukraine as well. Uh, today, the head of uh, National Security Defense Council of Ukraine, Alexei Danilov, said the following, uh, quote, the Russian language should disappear from our territory, end of quote. 
And another quote, look, we don't want anything from them. Let them get away from us. Let them go to their swamps and croak in their Russian. End of quote. Does the UN uh, believe that this kind of attitude uh, is a kind of a respectful attitude to Russian-speaking natives of, of Look, Ukraine? Look, we, we have seen during this, bef since the start of this conflict and before, we have seen a lot of rhetoric, which to say the least, is unhelpful. Uh, and I think uh, words, actions matter and, and words matter. Ms. Fasulo. <clears throat> Thank you, Steph. Turning to another subject, yeah. the DPRK. Yeah. We know the Security Council met mm -hmm. about the rec you know, recent mm -hmm. missiles in the past uh, months or so. But I was wondering, here we are two weeks later, What can you just describe what the level of, of uh, linkage is between the UN and, and uh, DPRK in terms of what kind of uh, involvement in terms of where levels of perhaps humanitarian aid and, again, I always ask you this: What about any back channel <laughs> discussions about? Well, back you know, back this? channels are back channel. Um, there is, you know, I, there is some contacts with the DPRK, uh, but I would not call it extensive. Uh, and on the humanitarian situation, we can try to get you uh, an update. But as you know, we ha I don't think we've had international staff in the DPRK now for quite some time due uh, to the COVID issues. And that hasn't really changed. Just following up mm -hmm. on the little links, you know, little uh, that you have, um, are those communica or are communications uh, carry being carried out, for example, here in New York with the uh, North Korean mission to the UN? I mean, some of it, some of it there, uh, and some of it, I think, through the through the foreign ministry in Pyongyang when it has to when it has to do directly with the UN presence in um, in DPRK. Um, before I go to you up to summon James, I just want to read out a statement on Nigeria. Uh, the Secretary General is saddened to learn about the recent flooding in Nigeria, which is the worst in a decade. Hundreds of lives and livelihoods have been lost. 1.3 million people have been displaced, and more than 2.8 million people have been impacted by these floods. Infrastructure and farmland have also been damaged, worsening the, co the cost of living across Nigeria. The Secretary General extends his deepest condolences to the government of Nigeria and all of the impacted families. He reiterates the United Nations continued commitment to supporting the government of Nigeria in this challenging time. Ibtisam. Um, so uh, UN experts, uh, special reporters, condemned the Israeli, what they called Israeli sadistic, uh, punitive measures against French Palestinian right uh, defender Salah Hamouri. I asked you about Mr. Hamouri last week. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you have any statement. No, and it's. Uh, and he, he's the human rights lawyer yeah. who is um, on hunger strike and well, since six months with no. Um, uh, under um, in detention by Israelis. Uh, I don't. Let me see if I don't have anything, and it's it's my. Uh, uh, no, I could tell. Sorry, I could tell you that we are uh, we are closely following the situation uh, of Mr. Hamoui and other uh, Palestinian administrative detainees held by Israel. Uh, we're aware that there are about 30 detainees, including him, who uh, who's recently ended their hunger strike, which had been going on since September. Um, and obviously, we have, uh, as you know, we have repeatedly called for Israel uh, to end the uh, practice of administration detainees by either releasing people or charging them when there are grounds to do so. Mr. Bayes. Sorry, um, to Ethiopia, as you know, and you said earlier, um, the Security Council has been holding a private meeting which has just ended and they've just gone into closed consultations, I'm told, uh, to discuss possible press elements proposed by Norway and the three African members of the Council. Does the Secretary General think it would be useful for the Council to speak publicly with one voice on this issue? Always. I mean, it is, uh, we, we, unity of the Council helps our work because we see the challenges that we have when that unity is not there. Uh, our colleague uh, Hada al Tahir Mudawi from OCHA briefed the council. I can tell you, uh, it was enclosed, it was a private meeting, but I can tell you that uh, 
as the Secretary General said in his, uh, in his own remarks uh, recently, uh, she said that the resumption of conflict is adding to already immense humanitarian needs in northern Ethiopia. All parties need to adhere to their obligations mm -hmm. under international humanitarian law. Civilians, including aid workers, and we've had about 26 aid workers killed in this conflict, need to be protected. And all parties need to allow and facilitate the rapid unimpeded passage of humanitarian relief for people in need wherever they are. Uh, our urgent message is for the fighting to uh, end and for talks to get, uh, uh, to get underway. Okay, I see, speaking of talks getting underway, I see Polina really willing to get underway here and brief. Ms. Kubiak, pencils down as they say, time to brief. Have a great weekend. If it'll, be, it'll mean that it will not have been a great weekend for us. So let's hope we are not in contact at all over the weekend.